So I, my name is Anthony Powell. I'm a registered nutritionist in Brizzy and work in private practice probably quite a number of years now. And um, uh, on the menu for tonight, I'll just give you a quick, a quick rundown. Um, I'm just going to go through the current recommendations and where we have gone wrong with those recommendations. And we're sort of on the wrong road. Yeah, but is there a new road? That's something we need to, uh, we need to start exploring. I'll look at lower carbohydrate eating and, and what is it? You know, uh, who here is, is, is you know, who, 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 is low, who would consider themselves low carb at the moment or lower carb? Who's totally confused by the whole thing? <laughs> who's keto, who's paleo, who's, you know? And I'll explain a bit about that. It's a, it's a real changing area. A bit of myth busting, um, which, is, which is always a bit of fun, but positive myth busting. And, and what to eat, I'm going to show you some food slides, some food porn, um, <laughs> from, from, and which is real food porn from myself or from various patients, because it's really important to show you food that, that you and I, um, uh, mums, dads, kids, in really stressed, busy days can actually do. You know, my wife works, we've got a 13-year-old, but we can do it as well. I'm not some, anyone different to anyone else, so we can all do it together. Yeah, a bit about me, I was a chubby kid. I was a chubby kid, eczema, migraines, IBS, crushing fatigue, the nutritionist who thought he knew everything, doing triathlons. So I really had to put my ego away and relearn. You know, here I am telling my patients what to do. And I think in many cases, I was feeling worse than some of my patients. Some of my worst, you know, I was probably pre-diabetes. We've got some not great Irish genes in the family. So it was wonderful about a few years ago, I really had to, as I say, put my ego away and change the way I, I looked after myself. And then that flows on now to my, to my patients. And it was really interesting. I, you know, it was probably about three or four years ago. I remember saying to my wife, I think there must be something more practical in life I can do because I was making no difference to my patients. I'd say one in 10, one in 20, weight loss, blood sugar control, cardiovascular disease. My win-loss ratio, if I was a footy team, I would have been, you know, the team would have been sacked, the coach would have been sacked, I wasn't getting the results. I remember saying to my wife, I might go mow lawns for a living. I could make more difference and probably more money mowing lawns for a living. So thankfully I'm not mowing your lawn tonight, I'm here talking about nutrition. My wife always laughs about this. She said, you wouldn't last a minute mowing lawns, mate. So we all, we're all looking for a miracle cure, um, you know, and it would be wonderful to give you that miracle cure. But um, the close, you know, I've seen many diets and changes come and go in many years for patients. But the lovely thing is, I think, you know, we're nailing it, which is really lovely to say. I think we're on the right road after going down many rabbit holes over many, many years, over decades, I think we're nailing it, which is lovely. Still a lot of work to do, but we're getting closer to it. So there's no miracle cure, but the closest I can give you tonight is, will I call it a, call it a miracle instruction manual or an instruction manual, which I think is the right instruction manual or close to it? You still have to read it. You still have to go through it. You still have to bookmark it. But you know, there's no magic pill, but I think we're going to start giving you a, a, a magic instruction manual, which is going to start hopefully helping with your diabetes and weight loss and cardiovascular disease and, and all those other um, uh, modifiable risk factors. This is, the, this is the, the, the current instruction manual that we've got, you know, and it's been there for quite a number of years now, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's just not getting enough traction, you know. Um, every day in Australia, 280 Australians are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And everyone says, oh, no, no, Anthony, that's monthly, isn't it? That's daily. 280 a day. 60 Queenslanders a day. 280 Queens, uh, Australians a, a day are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So the instruction manual we've got now it needs to be changed or it needs to be looked at, at least, you know, you know, modified. So what you're going to learn tonight, I'm not going to teach you a lot of new things, but I'm going to get you to unlearn some things. That's a big, big lesson. And I reckon unlearning, for me anyway, is a lot harder than learning new things. Would you agree? It's a, it's a, it's a real big one. 
Where are we going to start? Where's the point in history that we can go back to? Let's go back and look back in time to a US president. Oh, <laughs> but, wrong US president, I'm sorry. We can blame him for a lot of things, we can't blame him for our diet. The, the chap in the front is, is, is Roosevelt. Um, now he died of a massive stroke in 1945, just prior to the end of the Second World War. Behind him is Dwight D. Eisenhower, who died of a heart attack in 1969 after suffering many small heart attacks. Now, when these men were having strokes and heart attacks in the 40s, 50s and 60s, it scared the daylights out of the docs, the researchers, the, um, the public and the politicians, that men and women were being struck down by something which was killing them, a culprit, an enemy. The war was over, something was, was, was killing, and it didn't discriminate. White collar, blue collar, white, black, yellow, it didn't discriminate. What was the culprit that was killing people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially US presidents? Obviously the hat. <laughs> it could have been, it could have been. And there were many factors but one of the factors that we jumped on was one with a pretty bad image problem even back then, and that was fat. And it really does seem to make sense because when you think of fat, when you grab the fat around your tummy, what do you think? What, like, it's normally when I put this slide up when cardiologists are there, cardiologists go, oh gosh, they almost get a bit of chest pain when they see that butter hit the, hit the pan there. But when you think of that, you think of the fat around your, your belly, uh, you think of, you know, fat makes us fat. So, Im so fat really does have a bit of an image problem right back even in those days as well. When you think of fat too, you know, you think of the clogging action. Look at that white fat around that steak. Surely that's got to clog arteries, hasn't it? So when we look at real fat cells, it looks like butter. It looks like steak. It looks like eggs. When we look inside arteries of patients with atherosclerosis, what, is, what does that look like? It looks like fat. So we said, guilty, you know, fat is guilty back in the 40s, 50s and 60s. You're in jail, mate, case closed, everyone's great. No more heart attacks, no more diabetes, no more weight, right? Right? Maybe not. So fat was in, in jail and we said, right, case closed, game over. We don't need to worry about things anymore. What many don't realise that, that both Roosevelt and Eisenhower were smoking up to three to four packs of cigarettes a day for many, many years. So that's probably what killed them or added to their, you know, they were, they were you know, high stress politicians as well. The cigarettes, the alcohol, the sugar, the fat would have been there as well. But it was probably the cigarettes that killed them rather than the, 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 the fat. Around that time too, post-war, a lot of the new fats were coming on board. We were moving away from, um, we were moving away from eggs and cheese and dairy and meats and things like that, moving into more of the processed oils and you know, the ones you've probably got in your kitchen today in plastic, you know, corn oils and soy oils, canola oils, rice bran oils, the so-called heart smart oils, they were really starting coming, to, coming into vogue post Second World War when there wasn't when a lot of food shortages coming in. But we discounted that. We said, nah, it's probably not these new oils. It must be these traditional oils, that we've, the, the fats that we've been eating, the eggs and the, 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 the meats, etc., which are giving us diabetes and, and heart disease. And you know what? We've been listening to the advice. We've really been following the advice. And going back, say, for the last 50 years, our fat intake has reduced. You know what? We're following the guidelines. We're actually winning. We're doing it. We're following the guidelines. We are eating less fat and especially less saturated fat. Our protein levels have stayed reasonably static, the bottom line there. But look at the top line. Carbohydrates have slowly sort of crept up. So whilst we've been reducing our fat intake and fat's been in jail, incarcerated, case closed, look at our diabetes rate. Look at our obesity rate. So we got hungry. We stopped eating fat and traditional foods and we got hungry. So we really replaced, think of the, the fats, the eggs, the cheese, the seafoods, all our traditional fats, the chops, the snags, the avocados, all that food. 
think of it like big, big logs on the fire. You know, they're going to burn and burn for ages and ages. Or you're going to put a really good diesel fuel in your car and you're going to drive for hundreds of kilometres. That's what fat and protein does. It fills us up. It satiates us. It stops this boom and bust. It's like big logs on the fire. Carbohydrates are like little bits of kindling. Little sticks, little bits of grass. When you're a kid mucking around at a fire, it burns bright, doesn't it? It burns bright and then it burns out. But gee, it looks good and it tastes good. <laughs> That's the bugger with carbohydrates too. They, they taste good. We get a great endorphin rush and a great dopamine rush as well. So we moved away from a stoic, steady, big logs on the fire and moved to this, um, this, this quick, short, sharp fuel as well. A bit like a roller coaster. I don't know about you, but when I was on my car roller coaster, it's pretty horrible. That real fatigue, that always hungry. I don't know about you, but you know, I love when my patients say to me, they say, Anthony, for the first time in decades, I'm not hungry. A lot of us have probably never, you know, we haven't felt that sensation since we we're teenagers. So it's really interesting. So I don't know about you, but I was on the car roller coaster, having to eat every couple of hours because that the, the, the twigs and the kindling burn bright and burn out and you've got to eat again, but you're not allowed to touch the fat or the protein because that's sort of, that, that's, um, that's locked up. You can't do that. It really is like rocket fuel. You go up and then you go down. But the fats and the proteins are really like a Tesla battery. You can fuel that thing up and you can go and go and go for a long, long way when you fuel up on fat and protein, if you're allowed to. One thing we didn't look at too back in the 40s, 50s and 60s when we, when we said you know, fat was clogging and fat was causing diabetes and fat was making us fat, is a bit like you know, we eat tomatoes and I'm going to turn red. It's not really that case. You, know, you eat fat and it may not necessarily make you fat. The sugar intake was really starting to go up as well. We were really starting to increase our sugar intake. And a lot of this sugar intake too was in processed foods and in cereals and a lot of confectionery again. But it couldn't be the sugar because sugar didn't have the image problem, fat did. Fat looks like fat and fat clogs. Sugar couldn't be that bad, could it? Now one of the big questions I get is, but Anthony, I don't have sugar in my tea anymore. It's the one thing that I've given up. Who says that? A lot of my patients, Anthony, hey mate, I gave up, I went from two, two spoonfuls to, to one spoonful, you know. Um, but what you've got to understand, and this is a big one, if you can just wake up for 10 seconds and you can go back to sleep. The big one is carbohydrates become sugar in the body very, very quickly at a snap of a fingers. So I call carbohydrates slow sugars because that's the body's job. The body's job is to turn a carbohydrate, and I mean even a whole meal, whole grain, low GI, gluten-free carbohydrate into a sugar pretty, pretty quickly. So think of a carbohydrate like a string of paper clips. What the body wants to do is cut that string up into single paper clips, i.e. glucose. So if it's some bread or some pasta, some noodles, it's a string starch, or a long chain of, of uh, carbohydrates. The body will cut those up via enzymes or via digestion into single paper clips, yeah? And those single paper clips will, will be fructose or glucose. And it happens very, very efficiently in the body. And this is a really interesting slide. The green line down the bottom is a plate of scrambled eggs for breakfast. Look at the blood sugars. It virtually doesn't register a blip in terms of blood sugars and virtually no blip with, with, with insulin. But look at the cereal, just a generic cereal. A huge spike in blood sugars. What you're gonna get then is a, a large spike in insulin, which needs to push that, that glucose away. This is, um, who, who here knows about the GI? The GI index, glycemic index? Yeah, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a messy, you know, it, it's probably the best we've got. It's a bit like the BMI or the PSA. It's probably the, you know, the best measure we've got. Um, so what it really is, you know, quickly, is a measure of how quickly a food becomes glucose in the body. That's a, that's a, 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 a quick one for the, the GI 
um, the glycemic index. So the glycemic index of table sugar, does anyone know what the glycemic index of table sugar is? It's 69, okay? So that, that's, it's, it's a moderate glycemic index food, which is interesting, interesting, isn't it? Table sugar is a moderate glycemic index food. Have a look at the first one there, basmati rice. Can anyone see what the GI index of basmati rice is? Oh, hang on. I thought that was a typo. Isn't it interesting that that is the same? So that basmati rice will become sugar in the body just as quickly, or glucose in the body, just as quickly as that table sugar. But you're saying, hang on, Anthony, I gave up all these other rice and I went to basmati rice because I thought basmati rice was better. Don't worry, I did it too. Years ago, then I gave up rice. Um, look, at white, look at mashed potato. But you quit sugar, didn't you? Mashed potato is a third higher. It will become glucose in the body higher than table sugar. What table sugar is is sucrose, a combination of glucose and fructose, just, just normal table sugar. Pure apple juice or apple juice, it's got the same teaspoons as, as, as a soft drink, but it's a little bit lower GI because of the fructose, and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. Corn flakes, 93. Cocoa Pop 77, and look at a banana. A banana is marginally better than, than, than table sugar. You know, and you know what, and like bananas are huge now, aren't they? We can't even fit our bananas in our kids' lunchbox anymore. I saw a mango the other day. The mango is almost as big as a bowling ball. So the fruit is getting bigger, isn't it? So a banana, but Anthony, it's healthy. I'm not saying they're bad foods. I'm just saying we have to respect them and realize how quickly these things change to, um, change to, uh, to, to, to sugar in the body. This is another one too. Now, you might say, hang on, Anthony, but I gave up white bread and I changed to brown bread. Over on the right there, one um, slice of white bread is about 3.7 teaspoons of glucose in the body. That's what it'll become quickly in the body. Have a look at brown bread, 3.3, so marginally better. So what happens is we convert the carbohydrates, a lot of the carbohydrates we eat, the corn thins, the rice thins, the water crackers, the noodles, the rices, the pastas, the breakfast cereals, the breads, pretty quickly into glucose, yeah? Some of them worse than table sugar. We've only got a limited capacity in our body to store glucose, a little bit in the liver and a little bit in the muscles, and we leave a little bit in our bloodstream, just a little bit, just in case the roof caves in now and we've got to bolt out onto the street the body will leave a little bit of glucose in the bloodstream just to give us enough to, to, to probably run about 20 metres. The rest is all stored away. We reach capacity pretty quickly. We store the extra glucose as fat. So our fat is like on the right there. The fat's like the deep freeze. Does anyone have deep freezes anymore? We bought one recently. They're fantastic. You know, um, the Gen Ys, they say, what the heck, what's a deep freeze? But on the right there, and that's what our fat becomes. We start storing this glucose away as, as the deep freeze. And we start storing it around our middle. Anthony, I've been putting weight around my middle. Fatty liver, our liver becomes really congested with fat. Our pancreas, our various organs become congested with fat. That's your deep freeze. That's the body moving stuff from the fridge into the freezer. And you say, gosh, where did this come from? It's happened over years and decades. The deep freezer is starting to get full too. So we look to, to we're, we're eating too many excessive dietary carbohydrates. That pushes up our blood sugar. That leads to insulin. And this is this insulin resistance that everyone's so confused about. What the heck is it? What it tries to do, it's almost trying desperately to, to push all this glucose away and hold it into the cell. That's what insulin's job is. But after a while, it just gets so fatigued and it can't do it anymore. So it's, we become resistant to the urges of insulin trying to hold that glucose away into the cells. And eventually what happens is when our cells become so congested with glucose, we also start, we can't convert it as, as efficiently to fat and we actually start leaking fat into the bloodstream as well. But I thought in the 40s, 50s and 60s that it was fat making me fat. Oh, this is getting really confusing. Gosh, so it might be carbohydrates as well, bugger. You know, the, the body bites us on the bum sometimes, doesn't it? And then that can lead to obesity and diabetes. It's an inflammatory condition. We've got this, I call it the unholy trinity of elevated glucose, elevated insulin for a long period of time, hyperinsulinemia, 
and also elevated fatty acids. It's not a nice mix in the body. But what about if we can cut out the middleman? What about if we can start cutting down on those, the so many you know, carbohydrates that we eat? Is that gonna to lead to reduced blood glucose, reduced insulin, reduced fat, reduced cardiovascular disease, reduced inflammation? But then the patients say to me, they'll say, okay, Anthony, hang on, I get the gist of what you're saying, but are you telling me that I gotta eat more fat? Traditional fat, going back a few years? And the first question I always get from my patients is, but hang on, mate, what about my cholesterol? And it's really interesting that the, all this new evidence, this, is, this is a, would be a wonderful topic to talk about. We could talk about this for, probably Sheila and I could talk about this for hours. But it, the, all the evidence is coming out, a lot of the new evidence is coming out to possibly not point towards dietary fat, but a combination of fat, but also carbohydrates are also involved. If we can't store our glucose, we can't store our fatty acids, we can't store our cholesterol and everything starts leaking out into the bloodstream, the doc looks under the microscope, you've got high cholesterol. You've got high everything. It's interesting, isn't it? So it's a bit more complex than we first thought. You know, eat cholesterol, increase cholesterol. It sounds linear, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more complex. But then you might think, okay, Anthony's giving me a free kick to eat fat and go hard. <laughs> Give up the carbohydrates and I can go and you know the stereotype with the, the, the media? It's all bacon and <laughs> whipped cream. But just one, wake up for one more second and then uh, just one more really important thing to say and then you can doze back off before I get to the food porn. Um, it's really important that you don't, the, the most important uh, first step is to start reducing your carbohydrates before you start increasing your fat. It's very, very important to do. You need to do it under guidance. Um, you need to do it uh, in, a, in, a, in a moderated way um, and in, in a careful way. But reduce your carbohydrates first before you go crazy with the fats. That's very, very important. It's probably the one thing I see that patients are increasing their fats, they're keeping their carbohydrates high as well, and a lot of patients will actually get worse on a high carbohydrate and high fat diet. That's a standard diet. Okay, you, really, you could really uh, make, because the liver and the body is saying enough of everything. I want you to take a bit of a break. So we do have to be very, very careful with, with that. But another question I get, I get is, but mate, we need, we need fiber, we need carbohydrates for fiber and vice versa. But isn't it interesting, pound for pound, there's more fiber in green leafy veggies, asparagus, nuts and seeds and avocado than there is in grain without the 70% price tag of the carbohydrates. It's interesting, isn't it? This is a wonderful little study that was done. It looked at all these different breads, white bread, brown bread, sourdough bread, multigrain bread, and look at the increase in insulin and the increase in blood sugar almost identical but you're having brown bread aren't you fiber can only do fiber will do a job don't get me wrong but it can only do so much so is are the carbs a wolf in sheep's clothing i'll leave that to you does fruit get a free kick we're coming into stone fruit season there's no seeds in fruit anymore is there have you do you find have you found a seed in fruit there's no seeds in fruit. The, the, the skin is very thin. The pieces of fruit are, are huge. And, and this is a, um, a, a real tough one to broach um, in, in public health and with docs um, and with the politicians too, because if I start questioning fruit, it's like, whoa, 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 hang on, mate. You're questioning the farmer. You're questioning health. You're questioning everything. It's a tough one to broach, but you can't, we can't really have sacred cows. We've got to have a look at everything. So I'm not anti-fruit, I'm just saying it may not get the free kick. So we've got to respect fruit, just like we need to respect carbohydrates and respect fat. Because in Melbourne Zoo, not long ago, they found the animals were becoming diabetic and overweight and getting fatty liver. So you know what they did? They cut the fruit out. Guess who else cut the fruit out? The local vet treating them. He lost weight and his family lost weight. 
But if we try to do that in public health, hey mate, don't be any fruit, don't be any farmer, but we'll do it for our animals. So breakfast before, I, I made my change a few years ago and the change for my patients. It'd be oats and quick oats, fruit juice and toast, and low fat flavored yogurt. It'd have to be low fat, right? A cup of tea, but I didn't, you know, didn't, there was no sugar in the tea. There was fruit salad, gluten-free muesli or wheat bix, of course, with low fat milk. Maybe a, a kale or an apple juice. Does anyone have kale anymore? I'm not sure. And there was a banana smoothie, of course, again, with low fat milk and low fat yogurt. Probably some honey in there as well. What about breakfast afterwards that I give to my patients now? It's a traditional breakfast. But again, I'm not giving them the traditional breakfast with all these high carbohydrates and the white crusty bread. If you bring one up, you've got to bring one down. The savoury mince. Gosh, you remember that as a kid, savoury mince? But don't have it on the, on the, on the white crusty bread, perhaps. The chops, the steaks, the snags, the halloumi. A smoothie, but not with too much fruit. And a lovely dish that I make for a lot of my patients and who get them on board trying to get them off or cut them down on, on the, the cereal. And I'm not anti-cereal, it's just that cereal is 70% carbohydrate. Just like an investment, I want to give them a blue chip investment, not a speculative investment. I don't want to give them something with 70% carbohydrate, which most, most cereals are. I want to give them something with a bit more fat and a bit more protein, some more logs on the fire. So I make a, I, I give them a lovely recipe for some nuts and seeds, some full fat yogurt and some, some, some berries, blueberries, strawberries, uh, raspberries, blackberries, frozen or fresh is great, low GI, full of fibre, wonderful. This is a, a, a meal I made just a, a few days ago for our son. It's just leftover bolognese sauce with some cheese and an egg. I whacked the lid on top, put it on low, jumped in the shower, came back. My, my wife added the parsley because she said that's going to look better on Instagram. <laughs> um, so my, it was no professional stylist, it was my wife. Um, this is a meal I had for, for brekkie. It was a, some halloumi with some bacon and the, the avocado. Where's the fibre? Where's the vitamin A? Where's the vitamin E? Where's the vitamin C? It's all in the avocado. It's interesting, isn't it? Again, you've got to do things, these things in the right order. A lovely frittata with some bacon and cheese. These are lovely ones, the, the breakfast muffins, just some prosciutto with some cheese and egg cracked in the middle. 10 minutes, 140 degrees, and you've got these beautiful breakfast muffins. You know, full of goodness. Vitamin D, vitamin K, just, just wonderful. There was a great program a couple of years ago. A scientist put a great um, show together on the BBC looking at what oils to use to fry in. This is a big question I get as well. What do you fry in? What do you do your fry ups or what do you, what do you fry in? And interestingly enough, he looked at all these different oils and he, it was interesting when they interviewed him, he said, well, the heart smart ones are gonna be the ones that are, that are really stoic and really stable under heat pressure. You know, you want your oils to, to be able to handle the heat of the kitchen, yeah? He found butter was one of the most stoic and stable because it's saturated. It can handle the heat. A really lovely combination, if, you, if you've, I'm not sure if you've ever tried it, is a combination of butter and olive oil, which is, which is lovely. Coconut oil as well, he found, was very, very stable. Really stable under, under pressure. I'm not a big fan of coconut oil. I find it too strong, but I do like my butter. But it's, it's, it's a good one to fry with because it's a good one under, under pressure. And going back to the lard, the drippings, the suets, the duck fats and these things, isn't it interesting? You know, you know lard, do you know what lard is? Lard is pork fat, yeah? Do you know what percentage, what, what would you say, how much bad fat? I don't like using the word bad fat, bad and good fats, or bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. It's a bit more complex than that. But what, anyone has it to guess how much bad fat or good fat is in lard? I, I asked my GPs and I said, mate, it's got to be about 80% bad fat or 80% saturated fat. It's actually 50-50. Interesting, isn't it? 50% saturated fat, 50% polyunsaturated fat. So why is lard so bad? It's got to be bad, hasn't it? 
Um, use enough oil, whatever oil you use or whatever stoic oil you use, use enough so it doesn't stick. And avoid or just start rethinking all the vegetable oils that we use because they're not good under pressure. When you heat these vegetable oils, the corn, the soy, uh, the rice bran oils, they're not great under pressure. They off gas almost. What about sweeteners? Oh boy, here we go. These really exotic, expensive sweeteners that we use. The maple syrups, the molasses, the raw honeys, the date sugars, have a guess what they become in the body in a matter of moments? Glucose, you know? So we do, we jump out of the one frying pan into the other. So just, just again, treat it with respect and now you know. Don't get frustrated with the information I'm giving you. Just say that you now know, which is, which is lovely. So lunch before would be a cheese and veggie sandwich, maybe a chicken and cheese toastie or a wrap. Salad with a pinch of meat. These salads are getting massive now, but we're just having a tiny bit of meat on top. Have you seen this? Or you know the salads now. Tiny bit of fish on top, a bit of cheese. Within two hours, you're going to be starving. Where's the protein? Where's the fat? That's going to, where, where are the logs on the fire that's going to fill us up? Sushi. Sushi is 70% rice. And what does that rice become? Ramen with noodles. The noodles are, are, are pretty quickly sugar in the body. And the curry and rice. The curry is a good bit, but again, but the ba even the basmati rice is going to become in the body pretty quickly. What about some lunch afterwards? Again, salad with, I call it a palm, a hand palm of, of, of fish or chicken or meat. Or some cheese. Something that's going to fill you up and get you, stop this horrible roller coaster, this up and down, this rocket fuel that we all have through the day. Especially by late afternoon, we're absolutely starving. So maybe some leftover steak with some green beans and some mayo. Some leftover bolognese on a bed of spinach rather than the, the spaghetti. Some leftovers, some roast, some stew, some curry and greens. What about a burgerless bun? You know, this is something we, we whipped up at home. It's some lovely Aussie beef with some cheese, with some mayo, but the bun is just some, some lettuce. I think I still had three of them, but you know, I, I skipped all the, all the bread. A lovely, this is one a patient sent in, a lovely antipasto plate for lunch, some olives, some nori roll. Do you know nori roll? It's like ripped up seaweed. Some cheese and some salami. That was their, that was their, their, their lunch. And a lovely big salad with some flavour, with some pesto, with some oil, with some feta and some, some beef through it. If you're vegetarian, make sure you increase your, you know, if you're going to have your tofu, your, um, your chickpeas and your lentils, make sure you increase the dosage of them. And maybe use some coconut cream and some ghee or butter to fry in. Something that's going to normalise your blood sugars and stop this up and down. A patient sent this to me, can of salmon, an avo, and a can opener. <laughs> and that's almost probably the, almost, I'd say that's one of the most perfect lunches you can have. Lovely. What about snacks before? Muesli bars, rice thins, corn thins, you know, the snacking is endemic. The snacking is just extraordinary because we're not allowed to have the, the, the steady state fuels anymore, are we? The traditional fats and the traditional proteins. So this is the snacks before for my patients. That's what I want you to start working towards. Because you're off the ro you're, because you're you're off you're you're off, you're off the roller coaster. You're off that horrible roller coaster. You don't need them. They're not going to rule you anymore. You can cut the cut the apron strings and move on. Because what happens to those those snacks and those carbohydrates? They're converted very quickly to blood sugar straight to fat. So your insulin, blood sugars, etc. weight is going to increase. Think of the freezer space. If you really twist my arm and whilst I transition you off snacking, a few nuts, and it's really hard just to have a few nuts, isn't it? You've got to put them in a Ziploc bag or what I used to do is just put them in my pocket. Never walk around with a bag of nuts in your drawer. I can't, I couldn't resist. So maybe you can, but I, I couldn't. I put a handful in my, in my pocket or in a Ziploc bag. A thumb of cheese, but cut it up and try to enjoy it. 
you know, boom, down the hatch and you go, oh, did I eat that? I didn't even remember eating it. You know, cut it up and try to savour it. Spend a bit more money on your cheese, your Aussie cheese. Olives and salami, ham and chicken, little bits are, are lovely snacks that you can open the fridge and grab a bit of turkey or ham or roast beef or some corned beef. Berries and yogurt are a lovely snack as well. Some boiled eggs. Boiled eggs are wonderful. They're like big capsules of vitamins and minerals. Wonderful. And most snacks have a high GI, your muesli bars and all these things. Just start reconsidering them. What about fasting? Have you heard about, you must have heard about fasting. Yeah, it's probably the, the big hot topic at the moment. It's very polarizing, it's very combative. And you'll get 20 different, how many books would be around? 10, 50, a lot of books about, and it's so complex, isn't it? It's something, actually, when you think about it, it's meant to be simple, but it's become very, very complex. What I say to my patients is the first port of call with fasting is start by not snacking and have a break between your meals. So if you're sticking with your traditional meals of breakfast, lunch, dinner, your start of your call to arms for fasting will be no snacking between meals. That's step number one. So we walk before we run. Maybe not snacking after dinner, which I reckon is probably the hardest thing I ever did. One of my lovely GPs said to me, it's harder than any exam she ever sat, was not snacking after dinner, and that always sticks with me. Because we sit down, we watch Netflix, we get the, the ice cream out and we just snack, don't we? We get back in our cave and we relax and we start snacking. So if you don't snack after dinner and you push back your, dinner, your, your breakfast a little bit, you might go from 7 p.m. to 8 a.m., and you've just done a you know, 12, 13, if you push your breakfast back a little bit more, you've just done a 14 hour fast. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's a great way to start and think about it. But you need to start thinking about your snacking. Fasting is not, you're not gonna fast and all of a sudden you're gonna drop all this weight. You are fasting to improve the functioning of your body. You're fasting to drop your blood sugars. You've got to be careful with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, with medication, with driving, with hypoglycemia. You've got to be very, very careful with it. You've got to do it under supervision and plan it. Check your blood sugars, check your insulins. You've got to be very, very careful with it. But it's a great way to, to try to normalise your blood sugars and your insulins and reduce that inflammation. Start clearing out the freezer space. So don't fast to, to lose weight, fast to get the body into a process. I say it's a bit like turning off the, turning off the motor, turning off that blender, the, 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 the pool filter that's been running for years and years and years. And you know that horrible smell when, you, when your motor's running for ages and ages? Turn it off in the body. Give your body a bit of a break. So dinner before would be a stir fry with rice and noodles, maybe a chicken pasta bake with a little bit of chicken with heaps and heaps of pasta. Because it is inexpensive. It does taste good. It was the only thing that we could find in the pantry when you got home and the kids were going nuts. So it's, it's, it's cheap. It's easy, isn't it? Carbohydrates. They last for a long time in the, in the, in the pantry. I know what you're talking about. Steak and potato. A lot of potato, a lot of that mash. Risotto chicken and mushrooms. What about some dinner afterwards? Would be steak and greens or some, some cauliflower. Some The thing is too, I like my patients to reduce their starchy veggies. When I mean starchy, I'm talking you know, the potatoes and the sweet potatoes and the pumpkins or just start putting them in the mix that maybe we need to look at other type of vegetables. So nearly all the other veggies are in. Only a few veggies I take out but almost every other vegetable is back in. Your collies, your asparagus, your capsicum, your zucchinis, all your Chinese greens, they're all on the menu. I'm only excluding a few or moderating a few until you start getting results. A cheese frittata with some avo, some curry and, has anyone done cauliflower rice? Yeah. Yeah. I remember saying to myself, hell will freeze over before I have cauliflower rice. <laughs> I would now prefer cauliflower rice to the real thing. I never thought I'd say that. Corned beef and veggies. A farmer patient of mine hugged me and said, Anthony, I can have corned beef. But maybe just start winding down all the crusty white bread with the margarine, the six slices of bread, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that, it's that balance. Uh, but he, he could have more corned beef and he could cut down on his bread because he had more big logs on the fire. 
not all these little bits of kindling, yeah? Pulled pork and slaw is, is a lovely one. Um, and salmon and veggies is a, is a terrific one. This is my world famous, well, it's world famous in our house anyway. Our, um, I just do the lovely ribs, some pork ribs with a lovely dry spice. Um, 180 degrees for about 40 minutes and you get this beautiful, beautiful um, uh, Aussie um, pork ribs. Just fantastic, really easy with some coleslaw, really nice. Um, that's a picture of a, a lovely curry with some cauliflower mash. The cauliflower mash is really nice. The secret with cauliflower mash is you need, you've got to have your butter and your olive oil. It makes a big, big, big difference. And salt, but again, salt's another, another matter, another, uh, another time for a talk. This was on the Diabetes Queensland website only a few weeks ago. It shows times are changing. That they talked about swapping out potato for cauliflower rice. But you know what the funny thing was with all the comments? Everyone said, why do I need to swap out potato for cauliflower? But now you know why, yeah? Because potato's got a GI of 96 and table sugar is 69. Um, lovely butter chicken again with some cauliflower rice. This is a lovely dish that my wife made. Again, it's, it's green, veg, uh, green beans, but it's got some fat on it. It's got a little bit of some hazelnut, some dill, some pesto, some olive oil. It, you know, the great thing is you can really jazz up some, some veggies and make them taste good. A lovely chicken bake as well. And a halloumi salad. Again, this is almost a meal in itself. You, it's full of fibre, full of minerals, full of vitamins full of vitamin A, vitamin K, fats and proteins. And that was that, uh, that lovely uh, pork roast I did. It was about a, a five hour pork roast at about 120 degrees on a Sunday afternoon. I didn't get any after photos because we ate it too quickly. <laughs> uh, and green beans. Now the lovely thing is when you have your veggies, you can put a little bit of fat with it. Again, respect your fat, but you can use your butters and your olive oils and the kids go, what did you do? just a little bit of butter and it changes everything. A little bit of fat. Uh, this is a you know, spaghetti bolognese, traditional spaghetti bolognese, but we, you know, I just put it on a, on a bed of uh, spinach. So you still have your parmesan cheese, you still have everything, but you're just cutting out your, your, um, your noodles and your, your, your rices and things, or your, your pastas. Some meatballs, again, really easy to do. I just get mince, so roll them up into little golf ball sizes in the um, size pieces in the oven, 180 degrees for 25 minutes. And you've got these lovely things for kids' lunches, lovely meatballs. You need your freezer packs, yeah, in the kids' lunches, but great snacks, great things for, for in the fridge for Sunday afternoon when you're, you're looking for, for some sort of snack. Um, and you can just add a little bit of tomato and a little bit of um, cream and you've got a lovely um, a, a main meal. Uh, and a fathead pizza is a lovely one as well, made on uh, almond meal and cheese. So dessert, again, maybe some berries and some cream and some yogurt. A cup of tea is a real nice one to stop you from, from snacking. Some cut up cheese, that old one for dessert is a nice one. Chia pudding is a, is a, is a nice one as well. But not eating is the key. It's a tough one, not eating dessert, you know, or, or trying to cut down on your, on your dessert. Alcohol. <laughs> you're thinking, oh, I, I nearly. <laughs> you think, oh, he nearly got out of the room. He's going to mention alcohol. The the one myth about alcohol is, you know, it's not incredibly calorific. It's like a multi-headed Medusa. It's not incredibly calorific, which is a big one for a lot of. Oh, really? But it disinhibits us, and we usually overeat. That's number one. It does stop fat burning because the, the, the liver's busy breaking down all the alcohol. It says, I'm not, I can't do two things at once. It stops your fat burning. Your beta oxidation, it stops that fat burning. So this is even a few, few beers or a few wines. Don't, forget the calories. It's just going to put the brakes on you trying to lose weight. I know, it's a, it's a real bugger. Um, it does make us hypoglycemic. It does drop our blood sugars. So it does make us hungry. And what do we reach for? All the snacks. And the day after, think back to when we were younger, <laughs> the next day you're still hypoglycemic, so you're going to eat for Australia. That's why you used to eat for Australia. You, may, you might still eat for Australia. It's a hypoglycemia. 
it's really hard. It's a, it's a real, it's a tough one. And being in, in Australia as well, where it's like gambling and alcohol, it's just a given that you may need to revisit that. And it's a, it's a tough one. And again, for another day. But again, it's not a sacred cow. Maybe put it in the mix with everything else we've spoken about. Detox on carbs and snacking. Don't, for the moment, detox on tea and coffee. We get that around the wrong way. Okay. When you go out, have your tea, have your coffee, but cut down your carrot cake. Enjoy your tea, enjoy your socialisation, but don't, don't snack. It's a tough one. We get that the wrong way around as well. What about takeaway food? Think about when you do go out, have your curry without the rice, Mexican without the tacos, ramen without the noodles, Italian without the pasta, the burger you've seen without the bun, and the steak without the fries and the mash. You're thinking, oh, you're ruining a good steak, but could you get a side of, of broccoli or cauliflower on the side instead? You're going to miss it. I still miss it but I know it's gonna put me to sleep. It's gonna give me that horrible brain fog and that sleepiness after meals. I used to get that, that crushing sleepiness after meals. It was horrible. Not anymore, thankfully. Um, and fry it without the bread and the potato. So go out and have your breakfast, have your fry ups, but say no to the potato cakes and the bread. Just about finished. One, uh, Sheila's gonna talk about um, exercise, but just one tip is, to lose weight and change things, change your diet first rather than go and hammer yourself at the gym and the, you know, run a marathon. Exercise will add so many years to your life and it will improve your life and it's so important to build muscle, get strong and exercise, but prioritize changing your diet first and then start thinking about exercise. It's very important, but it's, it's right to do it in that, that order. And so, but 50, 60 research pieces back, backs that up. It's really hard to lose weight with exercise, but lose weight with a dietary change and get healthy with exercise. We're, we've all, we're all living in a really difficult world. We're all anxious, feeling dislocated, feeling a bit lost, feeling depressed. So try to fill your emotional hole but don't do it with food. Do it with exercise, do it with music, do it with many other things, but don't do it with, with, with food because it just doesn't, just doesn't work, does it? My top five rules to get started. So don't snack, try to get off that roller coaster. Realize that carbohydrates become glucose very, very quickly in the body. Fill that emotional hole, but not with food. Don't, feel, don't fear real fats is a really important one as well. And exercise is brilliant, but not to lose weight. It's great for your heart and great for your brain and great for your diabetes as well, great for your muscles. So plan for change, keep it simple, measure, <laughs> be focused, seek guidance, talk to people, refine and work on it. Just like training for a marathon, you've got to train for it. And commit and learn to subtract foods rather than add. No extra supplements, no extra f health foods are really going to help with many issues. A lot of it is actually removing foods from your diet rather than adding something, some superfood or some special food back into your, into your diet. Thanks very much. Thanks, Becky.